This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a man arranging to get a telephone connection. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. This is the Clearpoint Telephone Company Customer Service Office. My name is Ms. Jones. How may I help you? Yes, I'm moving and I'd like to arrange to have a phone line installed. Of course. Let me get some information from you first. May I have your name, please? It's Kramer, Harold Kramer. And would you spell your last name for me, please? K-R-A-M-E-R. M-E-R. -E Got it. Okay. Could I have the address where you'd like to have the telephone connected? That would be number 58 Fulton Avenue, apartment 12. Is that a business or a residence? A residence. It's my new home address. Then the type of phone service you want is residential, not business? Yes, yes. It's for my home. All right. Fine. Now, let me get your employment information. Who is your current employer? I work at the Wrightsville Medical Group. Then your occupation is doctor? Uh, no, I work for the doctors. I'm the office manager. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Okay, and could I have your work phone number? It's 637-555-9014. 9014, great. Just one more thing. I need to know how long you've been at your current job. I've been working there for quite a while now. Let me see. 8... No, nine. That's right. Nine years. Okay, good. You've been there long enough, so I don't need to ask about any other work history. Now, in addition to our basic phone service, we have several special services available. Could you explain them to me? Most customers opt for unlimited long-distance service. It really saves you money if you make a lot of long-distance calls. That sounds like a good idea. Then I'll put you down for long-distance service. Another popular service is voicemail. Voicemail takes all your messages electronically, and all it takes is one simple phone call to retrieve them. Hmm, voicemail. No, I don't think so. I have an answering machine to take my messages. It's old, but it still works fine. We also provide Internet service if you're interested in that. I am. Please put me down for internet as well as phone service. Right. Okay, I think we're almost finished. I just need to schedule a time for the technician to go to your apartment and do the installation. Let me see. 
What about next Tuesday? Would that work for you? Uh, no, not Tuesday. I'll be at a conference all day. Wednesday would work, though. I'm afraid I won't have any technicians in your area on Wednesday. I could send someone on Friday. That would be fine. What time of day works best for you? Morning or afternoon? Morning would be best. All right, then. It's on the schedule. Do you have any questions? No, I don't think so. Thank you for calling Clearpoint. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear an extract from a talk given to a group who are going to stay in the UK. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16 on page 4. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Good evening and welcome to the British Council. My name is John Parker and I've been asked to talk to you briefly about certain aspects of life in the UK before you actually go there. So I'm going to talk first about the best ways of making social contacts there. Now you might be wondering why it should be necessary. After all, we meet people all the time. But when you're living in a foreign country, it can be more difficult, not just because of the language, but because customs may be different. If you're going to work in the UK, you will probably be living in private accommodation, so it won't be quite so easy to meet people. But there are still things that you can do to help yourself. First of all, you can get involved in activities in your local community, join a group of some kind. For example, you'll probably find that there are theatre groups who might be looking for actors, set designers and so on. Or if you play an instrument, you could join music groups in your area. Or if you like the idea of finding out about local history, there'll be a group for that too. These are just examples. And the best place to get information about things like this are either the town hall or the public library. Libraries in the UK perform quite a broad range of functions nowadays. They're not just confined to lending books, although that's their main role, of course. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20 on page 4. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. My other suggestion is that you consider an evening class. There's usually a very good range of courses on offer at local colleges, things like foreign languages, 
cookery, woodwork, painting. Most of them cater for beginners, and you don't have to have any qualifications to join. Each course is usually for two or three hours a week, and classes usually run in blocks of ten weeks or so. And the good thing is they're not very expensive. Around twenty pounds, certainly no more than forty pounds, depending on whether materials or equipment are provided. So you should find this affordable. And again, they're a very good way of meeting people because the class size is usually restricted, so they're small, friendly groups. Finally, I would suggest that for the braver ones amongst you, if you were willing to give a talk, say about your own country, you'd probably find that there'd be a lot of interest in the local community. Or you could talk about something different, like a special hobby. And if you weren't sure who to approach about this, I'd say talk to your local librarian, because he or she would know who you should contact in this case. And I'm suggesting this now because I do think it would be an excellent way of meeting people and possibly making friends. Now I'm going to take a short break here and give you a chance to ask questions.、Um, if you'd like to answer. That is the end of part two. You now have thirty seconds to check your answers to part two. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a prospective student and a university adviser about applying to enter the university. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-three. As you listen to the first part of the conversation, answer questions twenty-one to twenty-three. I'm interested in entering your business administration program, and I'd like some information on how to apply. I'm a little concerned because I've been out of school for a number of years. That could actually work to your advantage. It's possible to get academic credit for work experience if that experience is related to courses in our program. I've been working in business for several years. How would I get academic credit for that? First, you'll need to read the university catalog to see if any of the course descriptions match your specific job experience. For example, if you've worked in accounting, you may be able to get credit for an accounting course. So then, what would I do? You would write a summary of your work experience, relating it to specific courses we offer. Submit that to the admissions office with a letter from your work supervisor confirming your experience. Now listen and answer questions twenty-four to thirty. Would I submit those things at the same time that I apply for admission? Well, that would be the best idea. Have you seen a copy of our university catalog? Not the most recent one. I have a copy from last year. You'll need to look at the latest one. Unfortunately, I've run out of copies, but you can get one from the library for now, and I'll send you your own copy as soon as I have more available. Thank you. How does the admissions process work? Well, first you'll need to get an application for admission. Those are available in the admissions office. The application form contains all the instructions you'll need. That sounds simple enough. 
Of course. You'll need to make sure you meet all the admissions requirements. How can I know what those are? We have copies of the requirements lists for all university programs here in the counseling center. I'll give you one before you leave today. Will I need to get recommendations from my employer or former teachers? Oh, yes, you will. The recommendation forms are available in the admissions office. Now, I don't know if you'll also be applying for a part-time job through the university work-study program. I'm considering that. How can I find out what kinds of jobs are offered? You can access the job listings from the computers in the library. Are you planning to study full-time or part-time? I want to be a full-time student. Good. Then you'll qualify for the work-study program. Part-time students aren't eligible. As a full-time student, would I be eligible for a free bus pass? No, unfortunately. We don't have those available for any of our students. However, you can apply for financial assistance to help pay for your books or for your tuition. I'd like to look into that. Do I apply for that at the admissions office? No, that's through us. You'll need to make an appointment with a counselor. That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a lecture about the Anasazi tribe of Native Americans. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40 on page 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. We begin our series of lectures on Native Americans by looking at perhaps the most well-known tribe, the Anasazi, who lived in the Four Corners region of New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, and Utah between roughly 100 and 1300 A.D. The Anasazi are one of the most romanticized and the most studied of the prehistoric cultures of the American Southwest. They lived in the most beautiful locations and left a wealth of evidence of their civilization. Where does the name come from? Anasazi is the Navajo Indian word for ancient ones, and the Anasazi peoples are thought to be ancestors of the modern-day Pueblo Indians of New Mexico. The main center of Anasazi culture was in Chaco Canyon, where a large number of stone houses still stand. The Anasazi emerged about 2,000 years ago and gradually evolved from hunter-gatherers to farmers. Although the early Anasazi continued to move around in pursuit of seasonally available foods, they began to concentrate their efforts on the growing of crops, corn and maize, and how to store them. They are also noted for the beautifully crafted sandals they made and for their baskets, which were exquisite. By 500, the Anasazi had settled into well-developed farming villages, which were widely scattered over the area that is now the southern part of the U.S. state of Utah. Between 500 and 750, three important changes took place. The spear was replaced by the bow and arrow. 
in terms of diet, the bean was introduced to form a major supplement to the diet, and people began to make pottery. By 600, the Anasazi were producing large quantities of two types of pottery. Firstly, gray pottery used for cooking, and secondly, black-on-white painted pottery. Shared village life initially took place in big pits, where village inhabitants would have gathered together. These seem to have been replaced sometime around or after 900 by large living rooms built on the surface. These became year-round structures through the invention of ventilation systems. The house style of this period became known as the unit pueblo, and with the development of good masonry techniques, the wooden pole and clay brick architecture fell out of use. The Anasazi population peaked just under a thousand years ago, between 1050 and 1125. Around that time, the Anasazi constructed several roads, some reaching nine meters across. These extended up to 300 kilometers out of the capital, Chaco Canyon, connecting villages and especially significant religious sites via long straight stretches. At a later time, raids by other Indian peoples forced the Anasazi population to abandon their villages and seek shelter in the many cliffs where the houses they made there can still be seen today. Finally, around 1125, there was dreadful famine, forcing people to move northwards to the area of the Aztec ruins. Similar problems struck there as well. This was around 1275, and the Anasazi people were pushed to migrate again, this time southwards to what is now New Mexico. Various theories attribute the decline of the Anasazi culture to diminished resources, population increases, and the breakdown of social structure. Although the Anasazi eventually died out, their main descendants, the Hopi and Zuni tribes, now occupy reservations in Arizona and New Mexico. It's thought that the Hopi tribe, which we will cover in a later talk, were one of the... That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.